Thank you for joining us today for our second webinar of our technology and innovation series. We're excited to see people from all over the country and from all different professional backgrounds joining us today, from golf superintendents to community managers. We have a ton of information to share with you all. To ensure we have the best experience, I wanted to go over a couple features you can utilize during the webinar. First is our questions feature. Anytime you have a question throughout the presentation, please ask it through the chat feature under the questions tab. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and we'll get to as many answers as possible. Second, you can utilize the poll. We'll have a poll question in the presentation that we encourage you to participate in. And last, I wanna mention this webinar is being recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again or share the webinar with someone, a link will be provided in a follow-up email later today or on our website. I'd like to introduce the panel for today. I'm John and I'll be your host. I am an environmental scientist with Solitude Lake Management in the Mid-Atlantic region just south of Philadelphia. I've been in land and water management for about 20 years. Next, I'd like to introduce Bo Burns and Bill Kurth. Bo is our market development manager and an expert in nanobubbles. Bo specializes in the research and development of new technologies like nanobubble aeration. Utilizing more than 30 years of experience along with a master's of environmental management degree in resource and wetland ecology from Duke University. Bo is a well-connected industry leader who helped spearhead numerous nanobubble trial runs throughout the country. His thorough expertise has been integral to the success and growth of this new technology. He's also been a joy to work with. Next, we have Bill Kurth, the Director of Lake Management in Florida, and another nanobubble expert. Bill Kurth is a well-known leader in the lake, stormwater pond, and wetland industry. With more than 35 years of aquatic management experience and a degree in business management from Florida State University, Bill specializes in providing innovative treatment solutions for our clients using new products and technologies like nanobubbles. His knowledge and influence has been integral in bringing nanobubbles to the forefront in Florida. He has managed several nanobubble trials throughout the state and continues to educate the public about the benefits of this natural management method. Bill is a true asset here at Solitude Lake Management. We'll hear more from Bo and Bill later on. We have a great webinar planned for you all. As I mentioned, this is the second webinar of our technology series. We are always pursuing the newest advances in lake management, and we're excited to share some of those technologies with you today. So let's get started. You can see our agenda here. These are the topics we'll be covering. I'll get into some aeration basics, the types of aeration, some of the benefits of traditional aeration, I'll hand things over to Bo and Bill. They'll get into the nanobubbles. We'll talk about some of the differences between nanobubbles and traditional aeration. We'll get into some case studies in our seeing is believing. And then we'll look at what could be your aeration solutions. And finally, we'll wrap up the webinar with a question and answers session. Like to break down aeration. Aeration equals water circulation and oxygenation. By circulating and moving the water column, pumping air through from the bottom of the water body, this adds dissolved oxygen to the water column. With aeration, more water reaches the atmosphere and you can have that exchange of oxygen and being absorbed to the water molecules. By adding the dissolved oxygen to the water column, 
This allows more beneficial aerobic enzymes and bacteria to grow. And good aeration can also help avoid pond or water stratification, the layering of different um, of water. Overall, aeration can help provide a more naturally healthier water body. And as a result, you can be less likely to require algicide treatments, potentially prolonging or delaying dredging. So we have three types of aeration. The two on the left are the more traditional types, submersed aeration and fountains. And on the right, the new technology nanobubbles that will be talked at, at length during the presentation. Submerged aeration with compressed air, bringing compressed air from a compressor on the banks through weighted tubes into your water body, distributed throughout the water body with diffusers. I typically describe a compressed air, submerged aeration system like what you find in a fish tank, a compressor, a tube, and a diffuser, pumping that dissolved oxygen or that oxygen throughout the water column. There are excellent solar options available for submersed aeration. Of course, fountains, you see a lot of fountains out there. They're excellent for smaller bodies of water. They're an actual pump mounted on a float that goes out into your lake or pond and moves the water through that spray pattern, it moves a lot of water. And then the nanobubble technology, this is our premium service and we'll be highlighting on later on during the presentation. But determining the correct aeration option for your body of water will be based on your management goals, the water body size, the shape of the water body, the depth, and the overall volume. There's certainly some things to consider when matching the right aeration system for your lake or water body. So what can be some of the benefits of traditional aeration? Well, both the submerged and the floating fountains can help clear and filter out the water of its cloudiness or odors. It can reduce the accumulation of organic sediment or muck on the bottom, again, promoting those beneficial aerobic enzymes to grow and proliferate in your pond, that oxygen is gonna provide the right habitat for them to live in, over time accelerating that decomposition of that muck. In many cases, it reduces algae blooms or other water quality problems like anoxic conditions can help reduce the nuisance weed growth in your pond that you may be experiencing. This is a big one. It, good aeration really helps the health of the pond for fish habitat and other aquatic life by reducing stratification and increasing dissolved oxygen. Overall, good aeration can improve the aesthetics of the water body. I like this one. It can, fountains and aerators can reduce the formation of mosquito breeding sites in your water body. Mosquito larvae cannot go through their reproductive cycles in water that's moving. So the aeration or the fountains can create that ripple effect, not making it conducive for mosquitoes to breed there. In some cases, many of our clients use aeration to prevent some freezing of parts of their lake over the winter, if that's one of your goals. And we talked about the solar option for the submerged aeration. If you really want to reduce your environmental footprint even more, you may want to consider a solar or wind powered aeration system. But enough about traditional aeration. You didn't come here to hear me talk exactly. I'm going to transition things over now from our benefits of traditional aeration and get right into the new technology called nanobubble. Bo, take us away. Well, hello there. John, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, and I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am a little bit, uh, I guess, uneasy be, about being called an expert in nanobubble. And I guess I get that title within our own company just by default. Um, I've had the luxury and joy of being, of surrounding myself by the true experts. 
So uh, I guess what I'm going to be doing today is sharing a little bit of information with you that I've learned from the true experts. Uh, there are uh, uh, five different companies that we have uh, invested time and efforts with, and we've uh, spent time in the field with them. Uh, we've had lectures from them, uh, a lot of input from them. So I want to thank all of, all of our uh, manufacturers uh, that we've worked with for all the time and effort they've helped to train us. When we're talking about nanobubbles, it, it, this is really something to me that is, is really exciting. I've spent 35 years basically working in lake and pond management, and a lot of my time was spent in my uh, early days working with the development of new algicides and herbicides. And there was a lot of excitement there. We, we, we had some new tools that came about that were really selective and, and appropriate tools for us to do our jobs. But none of them have been as exciting as what we've experienced with this. Um, it's new to me, and, and I really want to take the time to thank Solitude actually for giving me the opportunity to look and, and to try to follow up on some of the new options and new tools that we may be able to bring into our own business. With that being said, nanobubbles really is not new. It's just new to lake and pond management, natural lake and pond management. Uh, nanobubble technology in, in Asia and specifically Japan and South Korea uh, has been around for about 20 years. Uh, there's talk of it in papers that were uh, talk and providing information 20 years ago. In the U.S., uh, nanobubbles have been used uh, for, for some time, but just not in the natural lake and pond uh, business. Um, most of what nanobubbles have been used for uh, previous to what us getting involved with this um, had to do with the medical field. Um, nanobubbles have been used to actually sterilize equipment, uh, operation equipment. Uh, actually, some nanobubble solutions have been used to disinfect wounds. Um, nanobubbles have been used in food preparation areas for cleaning of uh, 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 food preparation. Also, uh, there have been uh, reports that nanobubbles are used to rinse and treat fruits and vegetables. Uh, to try to eliminate harmful bacteria and extend the shelf life of, of fruits and vegetables. There's other reports and, and literature out there that supports nanobubble use in, in the hydroponic farming. Um, so it's been around and it's been used. More recently, we've, we've seen a lot of reports and some um, new technologies with nanobubbles going into the spa business where people are, are filling uh, spa pools uh, for the health benefits of, of a swing in nanobubble while they're in a pool um, and also swimming pools. So swimming pools alone without being in the spa uh, have used nanobubbles. Another big area where nanobubbles has been, has been used in the US and has been prevalent for a little while has, has been actually in the oil and gas industry, um, industrial wastewater. And that's actually how I first got involved with it, was looking at some of the technologies uh, for industrial waste. And while investigating in that, uh, we, we learned about nanobubbles and, and it became real clear to us that this technology could be you know, really beneficial to us in our, in our everyday use as well in trying to improve, improve water quality in natural lakes and ponds. And I don't know if it's just fate or if it was meant to be, uh, I'm not quite sure, but at that time that we first started looking at that and talking about it, uh, that's when we were contacted actually by some of the manufacturers that we're dealing with and working with today, asking us if we were interested uh, in, in furthering our research and development on nanobubbles. And, and it was ironic, not them not even knowing that we've already been down that road. So we have as a company about three years worth of experience uh, been compiling and, and looking at this technology. What is a nanobubble? Well, a nanobubble really is, is, is the smallest bubble that can be produced. Uh, it's nearly invisible to, to, the, to the human eye. Uh, it's less than one, one micrometer in size, um, 400 times smaller than the human hair. Uh, it's produced uh, uh, through water being pulled into a nanobubble generator. 
and then return back out to the to to the water uh, or the lake and pond. It's really hard to to imagine how to measure a nanobubble, but this is not just made up. There is a company, uh, Melbourne Panalytic in the UK. Uh, they develop instruments, uh, scientific instruments, and and for measurements and they came up with a, a way of actually truly measuring and confirming nanobubbles. If you look at that uh, on the top right there, you see a micro bubble. A micro bubble would be something similar to um, oh, a, a, a bubble in a champagne glass, for example. And you can look in there if you can see if your eyes are good enough to see all the bubbles that are within the micro bubble. And it's been reported and we have seen uh, in the literature and one of our companies that we work with has told us that there's actually, there can be 64 million, 64 million nanobubbles will fit into one champagne bubble. So that, that's a pretty amazing number and that gives you kind of a perspective of how small these bubbles can be. And right below that, there's an, uh, an, a, dent, uh, a diagram there that kind of just shows you the size of what a nanobubble is compared to a microbubble and an ultra-fine bubble. And you know, when we talk about this, uh, even in the literature today and even with the different companies that we've dealt with, I think everybody has their own interpretation of what a nanobubble really is by size and by definition. Um, but one thing that seems to be consistent is that a nanobubble uh, typically is in the size of 10 to 100 nanometers. And uh, that's a pretty small number. Um, it's really important to, to also understand that nanobubbles, when they're produced, um, there is also the art and science of taking and infusing those bubbles with gases. And those gases then are put back into the natural water body and those gases are either atmospheric air, oxygen from the atmosphere that is put into them. Uh, some are put in with a uh, oxygen generator and uh, also ozone. And uh, ozone would be an O3 and uh, that changes to O2 once it's uh, released back into the water. You know, at this time, I, I think what we're gonna do um, it, to try to expand on what I just mentioned is take a little poll. And, and this poll is, is going to try to find out how much more oxygen transfer uh, can be achieved with a nanobubble technology versus traditional air diffused aeration. I'll give everybody a little chance to take a time and, and try to pick your answer you think is best. And uh, the reason for this poll is, again, to exemplify and, and, and to exaggerate a little bit to help put in your mind how small and how much we're talking about when we're talking about nanobubbles. And once our poll is completed, then we'll go ahead and, and talk a little bit more about those sure numbers and what they actually mean. And I've been told that these numbers that, that, that have been derived actually come from a situation uh, where it's uh, an average. And the answer to our poll is actually C, it's 79,000 times more oxygen is generated through nanobubble technology versus traditional air or diffused air. Now it's important to remember that th that number is an average number and that it, it can really vary a lot, specifically when you get into a natural lake and pond where you have a lot of other things going on. Um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the 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 other factors that can really play into the amount of uh, oxygen that has been put into the water can have a lot to do with the amount of organic material that's in a pond. Uh, it, it can have a lot to do with the size. There's a lot of factors that can can determine that. And there's also different ways of producing nanobubbles, and not all of them are the same. And there's also big differences for um, how those bubbles are distributed into the water column. So at this time, I wanna talk a little bit more on, on, on how nanobubbles actually work. A 
And this diagram is, is pretty good at kind of showing a macro bubble, a, a micro bubble, and then a nano bubble again. And most of our traditional aeration provides bubbles that are somewhere in that size range where, where as they're produced, they will uh, rise to the surface and burst. And a lot of that oxygen is actually then released into the atmosphere. The big difference between a nano bubble and the other bubbles that are produced is the nano bubble is actually uh, less buoyant. It's it's once you get to the size uh, of uh, of a nano bubble, uh, they actually sink to the bottom. Nano bubbles will actually form a carpet along the bottom, uh, right where your anoxic layer is. So you'll get a lot of, of nano bubbles building up in that area, and as the nano bubble generator continues to run and produce more bubbles, it actually will fill the whole water column. And some of the interesting data that we have uh, uh, learned and actually collected ourselves, uh, even in a five acre lake, for example, with one uh, discharge point for nanobubbles, it didn't take us long at all within two to three weeks that we were getting measurements that were pretty consistent from the top to the middle to the bottom, no matter where we took it in that five acre pond. So those nanobubbles do make their way um, wherever that water has an opportunity to go, the nanobubbles are gonna go. Um, again, a lot of people talk about that, that nanobubble being less than one micrometer in size, um, and that it makes it easy when they're that small, they, there's an awful lot of them that can fill that water column. The other thing that you talk about is how do they work? Once those bubbles are produced and they're moving and they're accumulating in the water column, they actually have, uh, from the pressure, they implode on themselves. They don't actually burst, they implode. And when they do implode, whether it's the oxygen that's in the bubbles or if it's the ozone that's in the bubbles, they actually uh, are released and then they produce an oxidation process. And um, oxygen and ozone are, are tremendous oxidizers. And when they do burn, when they do implode on themselves and they release those gases into the water, it basically releases a free radical that does the cleansing for us. The other thing that's really interesting about nanobubbles are that they're negatively charged. And being negatively charged, they tend to attract to positively charged particles within the water column, whether it's in the bottom, organic bottom, uh, whether it's in the suspended uh, in the water column, but they actually adhere to those particles, uh, even nutrients. And when, when we use ozone as a gas that's infused into nanobubbles, uh, it's really interesting because ozone, you know, a lot of people talk about ozone and being there's problems with ozone in the lower atmosphere, but yet in the upper atmosphere, ozone is an in, integral, inter, integral part of what we really need for, to keep us safe and, and keep our air here in the, in, in our, on our earth, around our earth. When these nanobubbles are produced, they're, those are injected under the water surface. So there's no ozone at all that's being released into the atmosphere. And if the machine and the generators are working correctly, you'll have no odor or no smell at all of ozone. And when those ozone bubbles, when that oxygen bubbles, when they burst, they're very, very short lived. They do their job very, very quickly. And uh, then they're being replaced as we produce more. So what I'd like to do now is actually move on to the next and, and actually show you a little bit and talk a little bit about how are they actually generated. Well, we, as I mentioned to you, we've worked with several different companies um, and, and we've experimented with, we have trials with, we have units in operations from all different companies. And it's really one thing that's uh, really a benefit to us is that you look at these things the bottom line is that they do produce nanobubbles. Now, there is some talk and discussion between companies that most of them produce not only nanobubbles, but they do produce some mic micro bubbles as well, uh, ultra fine bubbles as well. So you do have a combination, but what you're really looking for is optimizing and getting as many nanobubbles created as possible. So how are those bubbles actually created? And really to, to try to summarize it and try to be as general, you know, I'm not an engineer, so it's kind of out of my wheelhouse a little bit to talk about, you know, exactly how they're produced, um, but there's several methods. 
Uh, and we've looked at three different methods uh, and that's exemplified in this picture here. And bottom line is that uh, most of them utilize some kind of pressure, a pressure uh, dissolution or electrolysis or by a swirling motion, basically almost by creating a, a using a Venturi system. And then also there's a mechanical way of creating nano bubbles. And the mechanical actually has moving parts within it. It's almost, if you can envision in your mind, uh, a high speed blender where you're just putting water in there and you're blending up that water so fast and, and so violently that it's shearing those water apart. And as it shears apart, it's creating smaller and smaller bubbles as, it, as that happens. And some of the other methods that use pressure or the Venturi type system, all those bubbles then go to a, a, a single shear point where the bubbles are, at, or the water is actually broken off and even produced even smaller bubbles. And um, that's primarily the way that these bubbles are produced. Um, the important thing to remember too, and there are differences between all of them. Um, I would like to say that all of the ones we've worked with have worked. We've gotten results from them. Uh, some work maybe a little quicker in certain situations than others. But the bottom line is they do produce nanobubbles. Uh, it, the importance in the difference is how many bubbles do they produce, um, the size of those bubbles, and how is their mass transfer of the gas, whether it's oxygen, uh, either produced through an oxygen generator again, or is it an ozone generator that is being produced, and those gases are introduced into those into the water as it's making those nanobubbles. So either way, they, they, those are the ways, the typical ways, you know, like I said, there's four or five different ways to create those bubbles, but the end result is, is the same. And that's having those very, very tiny nanobubbles distributed out in your water body. Um, you know, we have, a, 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 we, it, it's important to know and have an idea of how many nanobubbles are created. And, and let's look at the effects uh, what those nanobubbles actually do in, 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 in improving water quality. All right, as I mentioned to you before, that um, probably one of the, the most amazing things that I saw was, and, and probably had to be educated, and, and I'm still educating people on this, and it's a little bit hard to comprehend at first because when you, you start up some, uh, a nanobubble unit and it starts to run, um, we told you that they're negatively charged and they actually adhere to positively charged particles. So what happens is a lot of the organic matter uh, starts to accumulate together and it actually floats to the surface. As those bubbles implode and they start to work to digest, you actually kind of get a film that floats up. We often will have, when a system first starts running within the first few weeks, you will actually see the problem that you have actually get worse before it gets better. That's to be expected. Uh, it's kind of hard to comprehend. You know, I'm, I'm, when I'm first seeing this, I'm thinking, oh, this machine's not working. <laughs> Our problem's getting worse. Well, that was actually the nanobubbles doing their job and working. Uh, the decomposition of that material is pretty quick, but it does accumulate. It does float to the surface. And you can see like on the picture on the left, you, where a lot of material accumulates in the coves, that's what you see. A lot of it blows up, a lot of it turns a, a, a light color, a lot of gray in it, um, the discoloration, uh, the chlorophyll out of the algae, for example, is, is destroyed, and uh, a lot of that stuff will accumulate on the surface for a short period of time. Then, it, then as, as time goes on, that stuff is digested and broken down, and probably one of the most important features is that when we're improving water quality, we're, we're improving a better habitat, a better ecology um, for our beneficial bacteria to live. Um, we highly do encourage that when you use nanobubble technology or aeration, as long as you have good aeration, traditional aeration, that we encourage the use of, of, of beneficial bacteria, uh, biologics. Uh, I know a lot of people have experimented and used them, and there's been a lot of uh, talk about whether it works, doesn't work. But the one thing that I, I, I'm pretty confident in saying is that when you have better aeration and when you have more oxygen in the water, 
you're providing a better environment for that bacteria to work and thrive and grow and reproduce. So we are actually providing a better environment for that bacteria to work. So it does really go hand in hand together. You know, the other thing that uh, is really interesting and obviously a lot, a lot of talk right now uh, talks about HABs on harmful algal blooms. Um, and even more specific, if you want to get into it, is 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 your microcystis, your toxic blue-green algaes. Um, we've had the um, the pleasure of working with several scientists and researchers looking at this and looking at the direct effects of nanobubble technology, whether it's oxygen, high levels of oxygen, like I said, is a is is an excellent oxidizer, or is it the ozone? And uh, the studies have shown, and after Dr. Peter Moeller at, at NOAA uh, has confirmed with his research that uh, yes, nanobubbles do control that bad bacteria. You're, and not only the bacteria, but the toxins as well. So you're getting the toxins are being destroyed as well as, as the bacteria itself. And, and that's a really important. Uh, and you know, you, there, we were exposed, uh, I'd like to give credit back to actually Seabro Corporation at one of our aquatic plant management society meetings provided a, a video for us all to watch and it was called the toxic puzzle. And it really opened the eyes to a lot of people. And if you haven't seen it, you really owe it to yourself if you're involved with this kind of work is to go watch the toxic puzzle. Uh, it talks about the direct links to ALS, um, uh, uh, and uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So I think it's a big, big finding that we have uh, documentation that, 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 that we actually can control um, the bad bacteria. Now, one thing to really make sure you understand too is we talked about the early days of nanobubbles was primarily used for sanitation and oxidization and, and cleansing. And, you know, we're talking about natural lakes and ponds here. So we're, we're really wanting to get that balance. We're not looking to sterilize and, and neutralize a, a natural lake and body. We want to find that natural balance, which is why it's really important to have a monitoring program and to keep track of, of where our numbers are with our dissolved oxygen levels, our DO levels. Um, it's really important that we're looking at actually controlling and and maintaining and getting a balanced system. Very rarely will we ever want to have complete sterilization. That's not what we're trying to do here. That can happen if, if somebody runs a machine a lot longer than it should uh, or in a small pond and they oversize the machine for the pond. But that care has to be taken in, 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 in your planning purposes, uh, your planning and and making sure that you actually have a monitoring program in place. And there's a big difference between control and restoration. Restoration, um, and, and for example, in, in the oil and gas industry, that's industrial wastewater, where they do want to sanitize that water before they put that water back into a natural lake and pond or, or our waterways. So there's a big difference there, and it's important to uh, differentiate them. Um, one of the other things that I, I, I will mention that we have noticed that was really eye-opening to me was that uh, in time, uh, a lot over all the years of using uh, algicides to control the algae that we had, a lot of organic matter was building up and it was a black, thick organic matter on the bottom of these water bodies. And actually two of the ones that we worked at and, and, and saw that after about 10 to 12 weeks, that not only was that black, organic layer gone, we actually could see sand, white sand bottom. Um, that's saying an awful lot in, in, in a short period of time. Again, these are small ponds and we were running these machines 24 seven as we're trying to learn. At this time, I wanna talk about some of the potential additional benefits you have besides just improving water quality. There's a lot of literature out there. And in fact, you'll probably see a lot more about these kind of things than you do actually what we're talking about with natural lakes and ponds. I told you that it's new to the natural lakes and ponds. Uh, some of these other uh, areas, uh, there's a lot more documentation. And, and, and for example, improved turf. Irrigation water 
where irrigated water is put on turf, um, there's numerous studies out there and reports that have been written to show the improvement of the turf, the well-being of the turf, uh, the health of the root systems of that turf, uh, providing a better environment for beneficial microbial activity in the turf, for example, um, all of that has been shown. So you not only do you get better growth of, of, of your grass, you also irrigated uh, nanobubble water irrigated on, on yields for crops, for example. Um, there has been studies shown that you get better yields, uh, better quality as well. Uh, it's shown it on fruits and vegetables and as well as on flowers. One of the things that's really interesting here is, is also that we have learned that you can actually improve fish growth and, and get increased 20 to 30 percent larger fish growth uh, with well, very well oxygenated waters. So that's another benefit uh, besides improving just the water quality. You're improving that water quality uh, not only for the, uh, for, for the aesthetics, but for the aquatic life as well. We've already mentioned that it's a benefit for the microorganisms and, and your bacteria, beneficial bacteria. Um, there has been reports of increased zooplankton, obviously, which helps the fish grow as well. So it's kind of a chain reaction when you improve the environment, the water quality of that environment, you get a lot of other benefits. Now, some of the things that also that to mention here is that we have looked at, we have two different platforms that we're uh, looking to incorporate. Um, we have annual management programs that we offer where we actually can put a, a, a natural, uh, um, a, a, a home-based unit set on the, on the shore, and that unit can run with a timer set to reach our objective that we're looking at. And we're also looking at a mobile type unit that we can have on a trailer with a generator, so we have a power source, and uh, we have either the option of putting ozone or we have an option of using just uh, atmospheric air or actually a, a, an oxygen generator as well. And we can run it for the time that we need to in a specific water body and then move on to the next one. So there's a lot of options that we can look at here. Uh, some of the other benefits that too that I, I'd really like to mention, and I did mention that it, it, it's a great oxidizer. We, um, we have talked with some people that, that uh, other companies that manufacture uh, peroxide type chemistry. And um, there's a lot of interest in use, trying to combine and using some of the peroxide chemistry along with uh, some of the nanobubble technology as well, specifically in some really bad situations for trying to control the HABs. So I'd like to put that in there too, and that's something that we'll be following up on. Um, the last thing that I'll mention too that, uh, that is interesting before I turn this over to Bill Kurth is, is uh, now there's reports out that there are actually sports recovery drinks that are made with nanobubble water and some of the elite athletes in the US are paying uh, big money to have those sports drinks uh, sent to them uh, and they use uh, as recovery drinks. So it's really interesting that uh, what a wide range of uses for nanobubbles. At this time, I'm gonna turn this over to Bill Kurth, who's been a great friend of mine for a long time. I really wanna thank Bill because he's really instrumental but when I first brought this to us, uh, a lot of hesitation by a lot of people, um, but uh, uh, Bill was one that bought on and, and, and once he saw the results, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Bill. So thank you, Bill. Well, thank you, Bo, for the introduction. Um, I'm very appreciative, everyone, for the opportunity to be here and, and share our excitement about uh, the new technology that NanoBubbles brings us. I've been involved in lake management in Florida for the majority of my life. And um, in the last decade or so, we've really tried to change our focus um, to be more proactive with our customers and clients and work towards minimizing the impacts of nutrients um, that are so common in Florida water bodies. And, um, you know, we've done that by using a variety of options. Um, I've been a strong advocate of, of bottom aeration that uh, John described earlier. And in addition to that, a lot of our communities in Florida, we use beneficial littoral plantings to 
um, you know, help take up some of the nutrient that's entering the, the water bodies. Um, we also use beneficial bacteria that, that Bo described so well um, in many different ways of adding that. And we've also sometimes worked with phosphorus remediation products like alum and phosloc uh, to try and, and limit the impacts of that particular nutrient on algae growth. So, um, we, you know, a lot, of those, a lot of those techniques that we've used have been very successful and we've, we've had some great success stories um, but in, not in every case. So we're constantly looking for new technology and new ways to improve the health and the, and, and the look and the quality of the water bodies that we manage. And so when, you know, like Bo said, there was a lot of people skeptical of nanobubble technology when it was first introduced to us. But, um, you know, once I started seeing the results, I became a big advocate and I truly see um, the potential in my mind is is almost unending of, of what we can do but you know we're still very early in this process we're we're learning still and you know even after managing lakes for 36 years i still feel like i learn every day and so we're always trying to uh, better how we do what we do so the first case study that i want to talk about was actually done in a small community pond in south carolina um, the pond is 0.13 acres, so just a little bit over a tenth of an acre, and very shallow. I don't think there was any area in the pond that was below, um, was deeper than three feet in depth. Um, and a lot of times when you have a small, shallow pond like that, out and, and where the entire bottom of the pond is subject to sunlight penetration, algae problems can, can be very difficult to keep up with and, and control because all of the pond tends to grow algae. Um, this particular pond liked to grow a cyanobacteria and a sheet forming type that, that actually grew in very thick mats and the particular cyanobacteria in this pond was known as nostoc and you know cyanobacteria even though they're truly a bacteria we tend to call them blue green algae because they also act very much like algae and nostoc is one of those um the um, so we set up a nano bubble machine in this community because uh, traditional control methods for this nostoc algae were unsuccessful and the lake really looked horrible um, and it was causing a lot of issues for the community. So um, the nano bubble machine that was set up on this particular site was one that introduced not only oxygen but also ozone. And um, as soon as we fired it up, the uh, the results were pretty dramatic, very quickly. Um, you could see almost immediately that something was going on. We, we, we felt like the algae was being impacted, but um, it, it was what was really evident was within, within the first 10 hours, the dissolved oxygen level in that pond went from 3.8 parts per million to 8.2 parts per million, a dramatic increase. And, and as, the, as the trial continued for three days, those levels got even higher. A matter of fact, as, as Bo said, you, you don't wanna have too much of a good thing. So we actually had to shut down um, the ozone to make certain that the dissolved oxygen levels didn't get too high. The, um, the end result at three days was that the algae had virtually disappeared and we had dissolved, oxygen levels throughout the lake from side to side um, where it, it was it was consistently high levels um, the visual impacts on the thick algae match were seen within hours but within like I said with within three days they, the algae was gone and the um, the really nice part about this study was it appeared that the bubble stayed active for quite some time so this was a very successful trial um, the the lake did not grow any additional algae for several months. And even after several months when algae returned, it was, it was a more beneficial green algae that is, does not cause the same kind of problems that a cyanobacteria does. So not only was the test very successful, but it was long lasting. And, and, and that gave us even more hope that there were a lot of different ways that we might be able to use these machines. So we decided to um, move on after that study and of course the community was excited the uh, they were 
you know, writing letters of recommendation that others should try this technology because a problem that had been persistent for a very long time had been cured. So um, the second study that I am going to discuss, we did in Estero, Florida. Um, this particular water body, uh, I'll, I'll call it a lake. It's actually, it was actually a little bigger. It was 3.3 acres. And it's in a nice um, golf course community in Estero. Um, the community has numerous wetlands, ponds, lakes, a golf course, and homes. Um, because of the fact that this water body at 3.3 acres was quite a bit more uh, larger in size than the, the first trial that we did, we, we had some concern because we, we had not experienced like that size. Um, but we decided to move ahead and, and see how it would work. Um, you know, if you look at the pictures on your screen, everything on the right side of those photographs is golf course, everything on the left is homes. And you can see the bridge that goes across the, the lake and that's actually a cart path bridge uh, that takes golfers on to the next golf hole. Um, this lake had been um, a big management problem for years because of the out of control algae growth that was um, occurring. It's, you know, I was aware of the situation um, for a period of at least 10 years. Um, I managed it on and off. But what I can tell you is the community did everything that they thought they could. There was an aeration system installed. Um, and over time, they actually upgraded the aeration system where they, where, where they put double the amount of diffusers that anyone would typically put into a lake of that size in an effort to have consistent oxygen levels and benefit the beneficial bacteria to try and, and minimize uh, the growth of muck and hopefully the growth of algae. Um, they also added littoral plantings around the shoreline. Um, those were, were um, sometimes impacted by efforts to control the algae. Um, they were replanted, so they, they did a lot of that. And then we also started adding beneficial bacteria and then we went so far as to add a um, beneficial bacteria grower, which is a device that sits by the lake, actually grows live beneficial bacteria and automatically empties it into the lake um, every few days. So this community really was, was doing everything they could to um, help out in battling this problem. Um, yet we still ended up with large algae mats. And a lot of times the algae mats would come up and they would, um, the wind would blow them into one corner, particularly right behind the homes, and there were there were smell issues, odor issues, and um, and it was a very unsightly. And the particular algae that likes to grow in this lake is called Oscillatoria, which is another cyanobacteria. And Oscillatoria is really really difficult to control by normal means. Um, any of the algaecides we use are relatively ineffective, and Oscillatoria will grow across the entire bottom of the lake. And even though this lake, when, when water levels are up at control elevation, uh, is as deep as 12 feet deep, um, the oscillatoria grows over the entire bottom of the lake. And after a certain period of time of growth, they would float up and cause these big, ugly mats. And, and um, you know, it was all that could be done to try and keep the mats off the surface. But as soon as you got rid of them, more were coming up. So even with the addition of bacteria, we were unsuccessful. And in this particular lake, um, we tracked a six month period. We actually spent $8,000 in products trying to control submerged weeds and algae in this pond. So it was, it was out of control and, and we, were, we were aggressively trying to solve the problem in any way that we could and, and we were still being relatively un, unsuccessful. So this seemed like a great site to do our second nano bubble trial. Um, when we fired up the machine in, in this lake, um, we we did have some problems in the in where it was running um, sporadically, and that had to do more with electrical supply than anything else. So the results um, we didn't see the full results we wanted to see for a month. But even so, this is a lake that had a problem for a very long time, and you know a month is not that long to wait. But the machine was running sporadically, and it was a much larger lake than we had done before, so it wasn't unexpected. But um, one of the things we did notice was dissolved oxygen levels increased dramatically. In two days, the, um, the 
dramatic increase was seen and not only on surface crabs, but from the top of the lake to the bottom of the lake, from one side of the lake to the other, we had consistent oxygen levels and they didn't vary from the deepest part of the lake to the surface of the lake. There was less than a 5% difference in dissolved oxygen levels. So we knew that the bubbles were moving through the lake. Um, we were very hopeful they would have impact. And within 30 days, um, this site looked much better and to the point where there was virtually no algae in the lake. And, and then we did start seeing areas of sandy bottom, like, like Bo mentioned. And a lot of times, um, you know, these really problematic lakes, you don't, you don't see that. And, and so we were really excited with the results in this particular lake. So um, the, one of the interesting things about this trial was I, I did go before the board and I told them that I wanted to shut the machine off because, you know, we, we had seen such long-term results in the South Carolina trial that I wanted to see how long the results would last in Florida. And, you know, sometimes in Florida, because of our year-long growing season and, and our, our waterways tend to be relatively high in nutrient compared to some parts of the country, um, we, I, I wasn't certain that we would get the same long-term effects that we saw in South Carolina, but I wanted to judge it. But when I went in front of the board, um, and it was during a time of the year when, when um, the community was very dense because it was season. Um, we had a situation where um, the board begged me basically not to turn the machine off because they, for the first time in quite some time, the lake really looked very good. Everybody was excited about it. And so we didn't want to turn the machine off. So, um, you know, even though we were doing a trial for free uh, because we were trying to learn about the technology, um, I committed to extend that to the end of season, which just ended. And um, the community saw so much value in this that um, they have decided to add this into their maintenance program as a service. And there's no plans at this point to remove that machine. It's going to continue to run. So um, once again, now, now we've had two really good uh, studies. And there were others that went on that, I, that I'm not going to report on today. But I do want to go on to the third case study that I'm going to talk about today. And this case study is just a little bit down the road from the other one in Bonita Springs, Florida. Uh, once again, we're in Southwest Florida in an area south of Fort Myers. Um, this particular community, we've managed the lakes for many, many years, um, and it tends to be quite a challenge. There's over 100 lakes and ponds in this community. Um, it has several golf courses, um, beautiful, beautiful home sites, a lot of wetland areas, um, a lot of natural areas. It's, it's a beautiful community, but um, the lakes tend to be problematic. And, and sometimes um, a lot of that has to do with the, the water quality and not necessarily nutrient levels, but hardness and pH and alkalinity. Um, in a lot of times, typical algicides do not work effectively when you have hard water. And in, in this property, the water hardness is especially during a dry season, um, off the scale high. So when you do get an algae bloom, it is very, very difficult to control. Um, you know, over the years, this, the, the, the board in that community is very active and very educated. Um, they educate people of how to minimize nutrient loading, being careful with, with fertilization. Um, we've done a lot of littoral plantings. They have bottom aeration in many, many lakes, and it has been, that has been successful in a lot of situations. Um, we have used Foslock in this property. We've used um, we've used beneficial bacteria. Um, we've used pretty much everything at our um, everything that we have available to try and improve the lakes. And, and in a lot of situations, we've been very successful. But there are some lakes that still, no matter how hard we try, um, give us a challenge. So um, I chose that property to do the next trial. And we, we chose, we had one particular section of the property. It seems to be really problematic. So we decided to um, do, do this particular pond. This one is 1.3 acres. Um, it's bordered on one side by homes, on another side by a golf course. And it's also along a, a roadside, which is a major thoroughfare that goes through the community. So it's a very visible lake. And um, constant algae issues with this lake. Um, it, it was very difficult for us to control, and um, it was almost always cyanobacteria types of algae, and we were we were frustrated with our our lack of ability to make the lake look as good as we would have liked to. So um, we installed the machine on this lake. 
We ceased all algae treatments. Um, and yet within two weeks, we, there was no visible surface algae, which is the first time probably in six months on this particular water body. Um, and then at two weeks, when we took a close look, you could even tell that the algae coat in the bottom appeared to be dying off. Um, on the next inspection, we saw open sand bottom in areas where it had always been covered with algae or, you know, black soil or muck, and we started seeing sand. So, you know, after 15 years of difficulty with this lake, it looked very good. And, um, you know, when we were out checking the site, because we checked it quite frequently, residents were coming up, complimenting us on, on, on how dramatic the improvement was. And um, it, it really had our entire team excited. You know, we, when, you, when you're trying to manage a lake and, and doing everything you can to make it look as good as you can and you're unsuccessful, um, you're basically banging your head against the wall. And all, all of a sudden, we had a solution that looked really good. So this one I did decide to turn off because I wanted to see how long it would last. We actually moved the unit to another lake that was, you know, just a little bit away in the same community that we were having tremendous problems with. That lake actually cleared up within a week. And uh, we were really excited about that. And this particular lake for a month or two stayed pretty good. And when algae came back, um, at first it was green algae, but not too long after that, we did see cyanobacteria, blue green algaes come back and the lake is being a little bit of a struggle again. So I, I sometimes, um, I'm not confident that in all situations, I, I do believe in, in some communities, we may be able to move these units around and get long-term effects from um, these nanobubble units. But in some situations, especially, you know, so far we're trying them out really on worst case scenario lakes. It's, it's, it's the lakes that, you know, no matter what you, you try, you fail. And, and, you know, luckily there's not too many of those around, but every once in a while you have some that really are just difficult. And now we have a, a, you know, another potential solution that we are really excited by because, um, you know, we've now had multiple situations. And I would say, um, you know, this particular community, I believe we're going to, we're going to at least propose where we're going to add five or six of these units um, full time on the most problematic lakes. And, you know, not certain whether that's going to move forward or not, but I, I do think that the board is very interested in considering considering it, it's, it's hard to not look at the results we've had and be positive. But I do, you know, I do want to say that we're really excited about this. We still don't know everything. We don't know, we don't know how big the potential is, but what we're seeing right now really has us excited. So I'm really um, glad to have the opportunity to present this to you. And, um, you know, I think that in some cases, we're going to improve oxygen levels, improve water quality, and get lasting results. Um, but sometimes in the lakes, like I just mentioned, um, it, it long-term use where we keep a unit in place for, you know, forever um, may also be a good management strategy. I'm very excited to be working with this new tool. The potential, in my opinion, is huge, not only in better managing community lakes, but also a possible solution for combating cyanobacteria blooms that have plagued many in Southwest Florida and other parts of the country. But in particular, last summer, um, the, the blooms coming out of Lake Okeechobee affected a lot of people in my area. And we do believe that this technology, if we can upscale it enough, um, maybe it'll have an impact on large water bodies or canal systems that may get impacted by this. And there's even some evidence that these units um, may have impact on red tide and not only the red tide, but the toxin involved. So, um, you know, those type of tasks were a long way from being able to solve those situations, but I'm excited by the fact that, you know, we might be able to really have an impact on, on some, you know, different harmful algae blooms, whether in the Gulf of Mexico or in large water bodies. Um, that's kind of the goal in the long run, but we're also really excited about the advantages it gives us in managing lakes. And, and what we can bring to the communities that we, we take care of. It's a great technology to uh, be able to bring to the table and offer a new solution that we didn't have before. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share this and uh, I'm excited to see where it goes. Thank you. Back to John. Uh, that was tremendous, Bill. Thank you so much. 
uh, those pictures and case studies were great. You know, pictures really do speak a thousand words. And Bo, really interesting there. He really did a great job breaking it down for us to understand what nanobubbles is exactly and how, how it works. You know, so what can your solution be uh, for your water body? You know, nanobubbles and traditional aeration, they are a part of our green initiative here at Solitude Lake Management, along with tools like buffer management and mechanical hydro raking and many of our other management tools. But selecting the right management strategy for your body of water is really going to depend on your goals. What are your end goals? And I encourage everyone who's listening to reach out to a member at Solitude Lake Management and request a customized consultation with one of our aquatic specialists or business development consultants to determine and provide some excellent recommendations for your water body. In the interest of time, we're going to move into our question and answer section. We've uh, gathered many questions throughout the day. I'll uh, read some of them off. I have one here from Bob from Maine. He asks, is nano bubble aeration cost effective? And how does cost compare to traditional aeration or treating your water body with herbicides or algicides? Uh, Bo, do you want to feel that one? Yeah, sure, uh, John. Um, <laughs> That's actually three questions all in one, so we'll uh, we'll try to break it down real real briefly. Uh, when, it, when it comes to cost effective, uh, a nano bubble unit device is a lot more expensive than what traditional aeration is. But in the same time, as you've seen and you've heard, there's other benefits that can be derived from the use of nano bubbles. So that when you look at the comparison of what all it does. Uh, we do believe that it can be effective over time. And, and with that being said, with those units uh, having a price tag like they do on them, uh, that's where we have decided that we are offering it as a, a, a management strategy and an annual management plan. So basically that cost is borne by us as a, an application technique that we will use uh, for a monthly charge. And so that does offset that and makes it a lot more cost effective. When you compare it to traditional aeration, I want to make sure that we we point out we're we're not trying to replace traditional aeration. We we are big believers. Our company uses a lot of traditional aeration, um, and traditional aeration is going to continue to be a big part of our business. Um, we see an opportunity for these things to go work together. Possibly, um, we also uh, we know that that. Uh, when you have water quality issues or if you have persistent uh, algae issues, then the nanobubbles do separate themselves out uh, as a really, really good solution. And if you want to compare them to algicides and, 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 and herbicides, uh, I think we'll take out the, uh, the herbicide part of it because we're really looking at more algicide use. And uh, those are tools that we use and we will continue to use. We need them. We're not trying to eliminate them. Um, but there also is a really important push for green technology. And if we can reduce our, our algicide use and, and provide actually better longer term results, then, then, um, then we're all excited about it and uh, providing additional tools for you. Uh, that's excellent, Bo. Thank you. This is a good segue question maybe to come off of that last question. John in Virginia asks, what problems does nano bubble aeration solve that tradition aeration, traditional aeration does not? Uh, Bill, do you think you could feel that question? Bo kind of touched on it a little bit. Yeah, John, I'd, sure, I'd be glad to tackle that. Um, first of all, um, one of the things I would mention is the fact that bottom aeration typically works more efficiently in deeper lakes. Um, I do think that there's great potential in shallow lakes where, where someone may have been told that bottom aeration is not a good choice for them. Uh, nano bubble aeration typically can provide a solution there. Um, so I think that would be one benefit. Um, you know, another thing Bo mentioned about the fact that we can oxidize certain contaminants and, and you know, you have to think about the fact that there's, there's things like um, for a contaminant, let's say fecal coliform bacteria that 
sometimes show up in water bodies where you might be able to oxidize that and control um, negative bacteria that you don't want on top of the cyanobacteria. But um, I think the, 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 the biggest answer is traditional aeration minimizes algae by making nutrients less available for growth. And that's a process that occurs over a long time period and the results are not immediate. Um, one of the things that we've seen with the nanobubble machines um, are the minimization of algae is noticeable, excuse me, is noticeable sometimes in just a matter of days and sometimes in a week to two weeks or a month, the algae is completely gone. And, and um, one of the things that I'm really excited to report is um, some of our nanobubble machines have now been registered with the EPA as pesticidal devices. Um, as we were doing the trials that I talked about, we noticed that, uh, you know, not only were we seeing improved water quality and water clarity and improved dissolved oxygen levels, but we also saw the algae going away very quickly. And, and we felt like the machines were killing the algae. And we can actually make those statements now that they are registered as a pesticidal device. So uh, we can confirm that, you know, these units on top of improving the water quality also kill algae and make it go away. So really excited by that opportunity, especially to help out in the control of some of the tough, to con the, the cyanobacteria that are difficult to control by other methods. That was excellent, Bill. It's looking like a great tool, this nano bubble uh, aeration. A lot of great questions rolling in in the interest of time. It looks like many of them have already been addressed, but uh, we have time for a few more. I do want to just mention that all the questions uh, will be answered and we'll be sending out a uh, group response following the webinar, um, not only with a link for this webinar, but uh, the answers to uh, as many questions as possible. I do see an interesting one here about phosphorus, Bo. Uh, Dave from Washington asks, will traditional or nanobubble aeration help to reduce phosphorus in a lake or pond? I think you hit on this a little bit in your presentation, but it's an important one. Maybe you want to elaborate on it a little more. Sure, uh, John, it, that, that, it, it's a good question. And, and, you know, a lot of people are really looking at ways to do that. And we, we look at uh, nutrient remediation in a lot of different ways. We implement a lot of different strategies. And I think we'll probably continue to do that. But what we have seen with the nanobubbles goes back to kind of rehashing the same things we've said over and over again. But there, uh, there's a good reason for that. And, and, and that is that uh, we do see whether you want to consider it a direct or indirect effect that by providing a more beneficial environment, a well oxygenated environment for beneficial bacteria to thrive and grow, they actually do consume uh, nutrients. So, uh, to answer that question, I would say yes, because we do provide the right environment for it. Um, but at the same time, we really would like to recommend to a, a, a more uh, integrated approach, looking at a lot of different techniques for nutrient management as well. Yeah, certainly whenever you're managing a water, water body, you know, an integration of multiple tools is going to be recommended. There's no silver bullet out there. Uh, but thanks for that explanation, Bo. Uh, I see this next question I think I can handle. Uh, it's uh, from Matt in Virginia, and he asks, how does aeration, both traditional and nanobubble, affect animal health, specifically fish? So in either case, increasing dissolved oxygen, however you're doing it, through traditional aeration or nanobubbles, will of course have a beneficial effect on both fish and wildlife in general. You know, we talked about it many times uh, throughout the presentation, but increasing that dissolved oxygen will create that environment that fish, uh, for fish to live and thrive in. And as, as well as promoting the health of the zooplankton and the beneficial bacteria, um, and overall creating more ecological balance in your body of water. All right, let's move on to a couple more. We have, yeah, we have a few more minutes. Um, Bill, you talked a little bit about the sizes of the ponds that you've had some of your trials on. And Fred in New Jersey asks, are nanobubbles effective in larger or smaller water bodies? What have you seen? I 
I think Bill, you got to unmute yourself, Bill. Thanks, Bo. I, uh, I'm used to speaking in person, not on screen. Apologize for that, everybody. Uh, it's a good question. We've only really worked on smaller water, water bodies so far. In my experience, less than five acres. Um, we do have the ability ability to go larger, um, but I haven't seen results yet. But I would say at some point, uh, the cost relative to the benefit might not make sense in really large lakes. Um, but I do believe that it's a possibility that you know once you get over about 20 acres, I think you might have to use multiple units in order to get good distribution of the nanobubbles. Okay, excellent. And like we said, you know, we're still in some uh, extensive trial phases, but uh, I'm sure a lot more answers will come uh, to us as we uh, carry through with some of our trials. I got a good one here. Uh, maybe Bo can handle this one. James asks, have we had any bioassays performed on these systems? Did we talk about that already? Uh, no, w w their bioassays have not. We, we have collected data in regards to uh, the reduction in chlorophyll and phosphorus concentrations. We've done the DO uh, measurements. Um, we did send samples to NOAA where Dr. Peter Muller uh, went ahead and looked at some of the work on some of the other canals that we did down in Florida uh, where we were incorporating ozone. And so we were looking at some of those results, um, all of them very, very positive. Um, definitely uh, reduction and actually control of all the samples that were sent in for the HABs, not only the HAB itself, but the toxins. Um, and uh, the results in the reduction in chlorophyll A um, and the documentation of all the increased in DO throughout stratification of the pond Again, top, bottom, uh, middle, and no matter where we were, with one discharge point, uh, uh, th those nanobubbles found their way pretty much everywhere yeah, the, the water would go. That's a quick response. Thank you. Uh, here's a good one. Uh, maybe Bill would be best for this. I get asked this a lot in the field about traditional aeration and how much noise can we expect uh, from the machine? Obviously, it's going to take uh, depend on the size, but uh, Valencia asks, you know, Bill, what what is the noise kind of, you know, the decibels or how loud are these machines typically when they run? Well, and, and John, I agree with you. We, we uh, sometimes do hear complaints about noise with bottom aeration systems. And, you know, we've been able to um, minimize that to some extent with our customers over time. But... Um, when we did our first trial with one of the units in Florida, there were some noise complaints because of the size of the unit. So it depends upon the size of the unit. We were starting out with some big ones um, initially, um, but the last data I saw was a 65 decibel level um, in the units that we're more commonly going to use in communities where the units will be around homes. And typically that's going to be um, less noisy than your air conditioning system or a pool filter so it's not really a noise issue and you know you can also do a little bit of landscaping around them to minimize it even further yeah there's always techniques to help dampen that noise and i think the benefits greatly outweigh the uh um, the minor nuisance of the noise in many cases i have one here from nan i think i can handle uh nan from georgia asks does aeration help avoid having to dredge in the future uh, I get this one a lot, uh, talking about traditional aeration. Uh, we talked about the combination of good aeration as well as beneficial aeration, uh, beneficial bacteria into a, into a water body. And, and the answer is yes, you know, good aeration, uh, either traditional or nano, will promote that proliferation of that beneficial, excuse me, beneficial aerobic enzymes and bacteria to live in your aquatic environment. And over time, that, those enzymes will uh, reduce that organic load uh in the water body accelerating that decomposition in some cases eliminating or prolonging the need to to dredge and remove physically remove that muck so a uh, good question there uh we have time for about one or two more questions uh, a lot of great ones coming in um, again we will have a follow-up uh, email with as many answers as we can uh, provide um, 
Bill, can you just hit on uh, Chris in Virginia asks, how many hours per day does the nano bubble need to run? You talked about this in some of your case studies, but is there like a rule of thumb or is it really based off of volume? And is there really need to be that, uh, you know, pre-survey done to kind of evaluate and determine how long a nano bubbler needs to run in a water body? You know, and Chris, that's a good question. I'm not sure we know the exact answer. So in in the trials that we ran, we ran them 24 hours a day, um, except for the one in South Carolina, which was 24 hours a day until we saw the oxygen levels actually getting above where we were. Um, we didn't want them to get above where we were comfortable. So we had to monitor that and do that. The, the, other, the other studies we did, we ran them 24 hours a day because we were trying to get quick results. So we, we didn't have any, any reason to want to shut them down. Now, based upon the trial in South Carolina where we had long-term results and knowing, as Bo explained, that the nanobubbles uh, can stay active in the water column for sometimes a period of months, I would assume that as we move forward with this technology, that we will find that we will have the ability to run it, you know, a few hours a day, depending on how the unit is sized to the particular lake. Um, but that, that's why we're, we're offering it more as a as a management tool where we're going to watch it. And so I would say that in where we use it in a community, we would watch the oxygen levels and then determine how many hours a day we need to run based upon the results that we get. Sure, sure. Like many of our management strategies, we really have to make a full evaluation uh, before we can kind of prescribe the uh, antidote, so to speak. And last question, Bill, I'm going to hit you up again because this guy, Sam, in, in Florida, <clears throat> and he asks, will nanobubbles help increase oxygenation in a water body that is consistently replaced with anoxic well water? So close to home, why don't you field our last question for the day? Sure. Um, Sam, another good question. You know, I, I, I guess the, the answer to that question would have to be it would depend upon um, the amount of flow out of the well water. Um, you know, sometimes we get lakes that are two acres that are used for irrigation where you're moving 750,000 gallons a day through them. And in that situation, I would say it would, hard, it would be hard to keep consistently high levels. But the question, if you said is going to help increase oxygenation, yes, it will. No matter what, the, the oxygen levels will increase over what they would have been. Um, the question of how effective it can be throughout the entire lake just depends on the turnover and the size of the nanobubble machine. Outstanding. Outstanding. Guys, I want to thank both of you. Bo, a tremendous work. Bill, you're doing really great work down there in Florida. Everyone who attended today, I want to thank you all very much to, for being in attendance. Uh, we can't get to all your questions now, but as I've mentioned a couple times, we will be sending out a follow-up email uh, with is all the questions and answers, as well as a link to today's webinar. I highly encourage you to share it. Uh, with other people from your community, anyone interested in the technology. And again, please reach out to us at Solo 2 Lake Management if you're interested in nanobubbles or any of our services that we provide at Solo 2 Lake Management. We'd be, we'd be happy to set up a customized uh, consultation to provide you with the best recommendations for your water body. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.